Reading 1 Code of Ethics and Standards of Professional Conduct This reading is common across all three levels of the CFA program. There are three major points covered in this particular reading. The first one has to do with the CFA Institute Professional Conduct Program. The second point is the Code of Ethics. There are six elements here and you need to know each of them. And finally, we will cover an overview of the standards of professional conduct. In this particular reading, we just talk about the standards. In the next reading, we talk about the standards. In the next reading, we will cover the standards in a lot of detail. CFA Institute Professional Conduct Program. All CFA Institute members and candidates enrolled in the CFA program are required to comply with the code and standards. And this obviously includes you. You are taking this course. So either you have signed up for an exam, which means that you are a candidate or you might already have become a member of the CFA Institute. So whatever we talk about here applies to you and that is why very often in this lecture and then in the subsequent lecture I might just be referring to you and put you in a scenario and we'll then discuss whether or not a particular standard is being violated. The Professional Conduct Program or PCP in conjunction with the Disciplinary Review Committee also called the DRC is responsible for enforcement of the code and standards. The DRC is a volunteer committee of CFA charter holders who serve on panels to review conduct and partner with the professional conduct staff to establish and review professional conduct policies. The CFA Institute bylaws and rules of procedure for professional conduct also called the rules of procedure form the basic structure for enforcing the code and standards. While you don't need to understand the details of this particular document, but what you do need to understand is the code and standards. And if there is a potential violation of the code and standards, then you will hear from the PCP. Now you need to understand this process. So, what is it that initiates an inquiry by the professional conduct program and then what happens subsequent to that inquiry. So that is covered here. The inquiry can be prompted by several reasons. One is self-disclosure. You might recall that when you signed up for the exam, there was a self-disclosure form. If you disclose there that you've been in some legal trouble in the past, or have had some issues with law enforcement authorities or anything to that effect, then you will hear from the professional conduct program. There can also be written complaints where somebody else, possibly a charter holder or somebody else who's enrolled in the CFA program might write to the PCP and complain about behavior that does not align with the code and standards. Evidence of misconduct. This means that the CFA Institute staff may become aware of questionable conduct through the media or through regulatory notices or some other public source. And the fourth one is perhaps the most common report by a CFA exam proctor. When you are taking the exam, you will be given some very specific instructions. For example, at the end of the exam, you'll be asked to put down your pens and close your answer booklets. If anyone does not follow those instructions, the exam proctor will report you to the CFA Institute. So this happens quite often. Make sure that you are careful. The CFA Institute may also conduct analysis of scores and exam materials after the exam, as well as monitor online and social media to detect disclosure of confidential exam information. A classic example is where a friend of yours takes the exam in Australia, which is well before the time that you take the exam and tries to communicate information, specific information about the exam to you. 
that would be a violation and the CFA Institute does monitor online forums to detect such violations. After the inquiry, the next point to discuss is the investigation. If the professional conduct staff believes a violation of the code and standards or testing policies has occurred, the member or candidate has the opportunity to reject or accept any charges and the proposed sanctions. So clearly there are two scenarios here. After the investigation, the professional conduct team will either say that there was a violation or that there was no violation. If there is a violation, then the member or candidate can either accept the violation and accept the sanctions or the other scenario is that the member does not accept. Let's start with this scenario first. The member or candidate does not accept. Then the matter is referred to the DRC. This is the Disciplinary Review Committee, which review materials and presentations from professional conduct staff and from the member or the candidate. The panel's task is to determine whether a violation of the code and standards or testing policies occurred and if so, what sanctions should be imposed. In a sense, the DRC is acting like the judiciary here. So it is getting information from the candidate, getting information from the professional conduct staff and then deciding what needs to be done. Let's say that the DRC determines that there was indeed a violation, then sanctions will be imposed. The sanctions can include public censure, suspension of membership and use of the CFA designation and revocation of the charter. So obviously, if the person who is committing a violation is a charter holder, then the charter will be taken away from that person or potentially that is one of the sanctions. Candidates may be suspended or prohibited from further participation in the CFA program. The other scenario is that the member or candidate accepts the sanctions and that is shown right here and then obviously the sanctions will be imposed. Next we come to the code of ethics. The code of ethics represent the underlying fundamental values that members and candidates must have. It is these it is this code of ethics that essentially drives the standards and what I'm going to do here is just read out the code of ethics and your job is to go through this code several times and essentially memorize it. So the first one, act with integrity, competence, diligence and respect in an ethical manner with the public, clients, prospective clients, employers, employees, colleagues in the investment profession and other participants in the global capital markets. Point number two, place the integrity of the investment profession and the interests of clients above their own personal interests. So this is what members and candidates are required to do. And you will notice later that there are specific standards that you will be able to connect back to each of these items. Number three, use reasonable care and exercise independent professional judgment when conducting investment analysis, making investment recommendations, taking investment actions and engaging in other professional activities. Number four, Practice and encourage others to practice in a professional and ethical manner that will reflect credit on themselves and the profession. Number five, promote the integrity and viability of the global capital markets for the ultimate benefit of society. And finally, number six, maintain and improve their professional competence and strive to maintain and improve the competence of other investment professionals. I'm not going into details here because these items then are reflected 
in the standards that we'll talk about next and your job actually given the learning outcomes described in the curriculum uh, your job is to learn these six bullet points we now come to the standards of professional conduct here are the seven standards professionalism integrity of capital markets duties to clients duties to employers investment analysis recommendations and actions conflicts of interest and finally responsibilities as a cfa institute member or cfa candidate we'll now go through each of the standards and discuss the substandards the first standard professionalism has four substandards standard 1a is knowledge of the law and what this essentially is saying is that you as a candidate or a member need to know the law obviously part of professionalism is recognizing the law that is relevant to your work in addition to knowing the law obviously you need to know the code and standards that apply to you as a candidate and then whenever there is a conflict between the applicable law and the code and standards you need to follow the stricter version and we'll be talking about this in detail later another aspect of 1a is that you must not knowingly participate in or associate in any violation of the law or the code and standards and if you feel that you are part of a group where there is a violation taking place either you try to stop it or if you can't then you disassociate from that activity 1b is independence and objectivity essentially here this means that you must maintain independence and objectivity in your professional activities you must not offer solicit or accept any gift benefit compensation or consideration that reasonably could be expected to compromise your independence and objectivity or someone else's independence and objectivity next comes misrepresentation you must not knowingly make any misrepresentations relating to investment analysis recommendations actions or other professional activities 1d is misconduct this means that you must not engage in any professional conduct involving dishonesty fraud or deceit or commit any act that reflects adversely on your professional reputation integrity or competence standard 2 integrity of capital markets here we have two substandards standard 2a is material non public information if you possess material non public information that could affect the value of an investment then you must not use that information to make any investment oriented decisions and you must not cause anyone else to act on this information either to be market manipulation you must not engage in practices that distort prices or artificially inflate trading volume with the intent to mislead other market participants standard 3 is duties to clients here we have five substandards 3a is loyalty prudence and care you have a duty of loyalty to your clients and must act with reasonable care and exercise prudent judgment you must act for the benefit of your clients and place your clients interest before the interest of your employer and before your own self interest 3b is fair dealing you must deal fairly and objectively with all clients when providing investment analysis making investment recommendations 
taking investment action or engaging in other professional activities. 3C is suitability. When you are in an investment advisory relationship with a client, you must do the following. Number one, make a reasonable inquiry into your client's or prospective client's investment experience, risk and return objectives and financial constraints before making any investment recommendations or taking investment actions. And you must reassess and update this information regularly. Number two, you must determine that an investment is suitable for your client's financial situation and consistent with your client's written objectives, mandates and constraints before making an investment recommendation or taking investment action. And finally, you must judge the suitability of investments in the context of your client's total portfolio. When you are responsible for managing a portfolio for a specific mandate or style, for example, you might be the portfolio manager for a large cap equity fund, then you must only make investment recommendations or take investment actions that are consistent with the stated objectives and constraints of the portfolio. 3D is performance presentation. When communicating investment performance to your clients or to the public, you must be careful about ensuring that the information you present is fair, accurate and complete. 3E preservation of confidentiality. You must keep information about current, former and prospective clients confidential. The only exceptions are the following. The information concerns illegal activities on the part of the client or prospective client. Exception number two is that disclosure is required by law. And exception three is that the client or prospective client permits disclosure of the information. There are three substandards. 4A is loyalty. In matters related to employment, you must act for the benefit of your employer and not deprive your employer of the advantage of your skills and abilities. You must not divulge confidential information or otherwise cause harm to your employer. 4B is additional compensation arrangements. You must not accept gifts, benefits, compensation or consideration that competes with or might reasonably be expected to create a conflict of interest with your employer's interest unless you obtain written consent from all parties involved. 4C is responsibilities of supervisors. The assumption here now is that you are in a supervisory role. If so, you must make reasonable efforts to ensure that anyone subject to your supervision or authority complies with the applicable laws and the code and standards. Again, this connects back with standard 1A, where if there is a conflict between the applicable law and the code and standards, then we go with the stricter interpretation. Standard 5, investment analysis, recommendations and actions. Here we have three substandards. 5A is diligence and reasonable basis. You must exercise diligence, independence and thoroughness in analyzing investments, making investment recommendations and taking investment actions. You must also have a reasonable and accurate basis supported by appropriate research and investigation for any investment analysis, recommendation or action. 5B is communication with clients and prospective clients. When communicating with clients and prospective clients, you must keep the following four points in mind. Number one, 
you must disclose to clients and prospective clients the basic format and general principles of the investment process that you use to analyze investments, select securities and construct portfolios. And you must promptly disclose any changes that might materially impact those processes. Number two, you must disclose to clients and prospective clients significant limitations and risks associated with the investment process. Number three, you must use reasonable judgment in identifying which factors are important to your investment analysis, recommendations or actions. And when you are communicating with clients, you must include these factors in your discussion. And number four, you must distinguish between fact and opinion in the presentation of investment analysis and recommendations. 5C is record retention. You must develop and maintain appropriate records to support your investment analysis, recommendations, actions and other investment related communications with your clients and prospective clients. Standard six, conflicts of interest. Here we have three substandards. 6A is disclosure of conflicts. You must make full and fair disclosures of all matters that could reasonably be expected to impair your independence and objectivity or interfere with your duties to clients, prospective clients and your employer. You must ensure that such disclosures are prominent, are delivered in plain language and communicate the relevant information effectively. 6B is priority of transactions. When you execute investment transactions for your clients or for your employers, these must have priority over the investment transactions that you execute for yourself or for someone who is closely related to you. 6C referral fees. You must disclose to your employers, clients and prospective clients any compensation, consideration or benefit received from or paid to others for the recommendation of products or services. Standard 7 responsibilities as a CFA Institute member or CFA candidate. Here we have two substandards. 7A is conduct as participants in CFA Institute programs. You must not engage in any conduct that compromises the reputation or integrity of CFA Institute or the CFA designation or the integrity, validity or security of CFA Institute programs. 7B reference to CFA Institute, the CFA designation and the CFA program. When referring to CFA Institute, CFA Institute membership, the CFA designation or candidacy in the CFA program, you must not misrepresent or exaggerate the meaning or implications of membership in CFA Institute holding the CFA designation or candidacy in the CFA program. So that is it in terms of purely listing the seven standards and the associated substandards. In reading two, we will discuss each standard in detail.